Hello and welcome to the swim brief. This is like the uh, tapas menu uh, edition of swim brief. We've got quite a few topics. I don't know that we're going to talk about it. Usually we talk about two or three and we give them each, you know, 10, 15 minutes. I don't know that we're going to talk about these for 10 or 15 minutes, but you don't know what's going to happen either. Eric, that's, that's part of the fun of this, right? You know, you keep things on your toes. So joining me on this gastronomical journey, Eric Wyken. Eric, how are you? I love tapas restaurants. Yeah, I bet you do. I would yeah, like to go to a, a tapas restaurant with you because you, you'd know what to order. Yeah. We've got two really great ones in Milwaukee, that state that you plan on never visiting. Yeah. I think I'll keep going to Spain and see. I heard they have good tapas there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Such an American thing to say. Touché. Touché. <laughs> um, Joel could not join us today. He's um, actually working on his thesis on why streamlines are bad that he's going to submit um, for a, uh, a speaking role at next year's ASCA conference. So, yeah. um, ASCA level platinum. That's right. That's right. You actually, if you denounce streamlines, you actually get to be ASCA level six. It's not an official tier. It's one of those things where it's sort of off the menu. It's secret. You yeah. have to, you have to, you have to get up to level five and then you have to go streamlines are useless. And then they sort of sneak you in the back to go, okay, you did it. Man. It's a good job. You're in, you're in your ASCA level six now. Now don't put it on your bio or anything. We don't want people finding out about ASCA level six. You know, it's just going to be, yeah. you're just going to have to live with the contentment that you made it. Um, speaking of ASCA level six, Augie Bush coaches University of Arizona. Um, they lost to Washington State, or should we say, that's such a negative way to put it. No, Washington no, State no. won. Washington yes. State won. My boy, boy Matt, Matt Leach. Okay, friend of the, friend of the podcast, Matt Leach, um, led his team to victory uh over the university of arizona and they you know they did pretty good against arizona state the next day in a loss um actually had the chance to talk to matt earlier this week um he's very excited about the the results um but what do we make of the shifting dynamics of the uh pac-12 conference eric um the hardest part about all of this is knowing knowing that and knowing the kind of work he's putting in, knowing the kind of things he's, he's created at Washington state. And, and yeah, we both know him. So there's a little bit of that, that bias to it, but being able to see him work on deck from afar and him, you know, I was, I was representing the branch with be told and watching from afar. He didn't know I was there. was able to watch, you know, the stuff that you see with, with you think nobody's watching it. He's, he's a legit human being. And, <laughs> and he's coaching this, his ass off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's doing everything he needs to do. The hardest part is that he's Washington State in the Pac-12. So, yeah. um, it's if he's if he's getting closer and closer to that top four, or top five, or whatever. I mean, that's a huge deal. Anytime it's a huge deal if he moves one spot up yeah, in the league. Yeah. <laughs> that, that conference is so that conference is so hard on the women's side for for anybody to be able to get in there. And he's trying to recruit against those teams, which Frankly, he can't, you know, for for a lot of reasons, other than the fact that he might be able to offer something that another kid would walk on at another school. And at this point, they hauled off and, and took it to Arizona. And, you know, to me, this is just an indication of what he's doing and how he's operating and it all 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 working. And just imagine what more time and more athletes that he's able to bring in will buy in and do what he, he does. So, yeah. And I mean, um, like I cut myself off here. I, I don't want to really pile on, um, Augie Bush, but I do think, um, it's, it, 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 there, there have to be, um, quite a few disgruntled Arizona, um, alums. This is a program that not so distantly um, in NCA history won an NCA title. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely, I think, uh, an expectation that Arizona um, should be contending for PAC 
12 titles, should be contending for NCAA championships, should certainly be, you know, one of those teams sort of hovering around in the top 10. And um, it doesn't look thus far, I guess this is charitable to say, it doesn't look thus far that that's what this season is going to be like. Um, it's not what's been happening recently. Um, and so I think probably a lot of people are just going to sort of be keeping their eye on what's going on with um, U of A going forward. And it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's it, he also has to deal with the fact that, that, that those, um, the, that period of really, really great success for the Arizona program was when it, they were coached by his dad. So there's a lot of layers um, to this. I'm trying to be, um, I'm working, Eric, I'm working on b being a better human being. I'm trying to be a better human being to, to Augie Bush, who, um, I can't imagine is having a hard time. And I will say, um, you know, one thing I, I heard from Matt, um, in his accounting of the meet and we, we, we look at, um, a lot of, we, we, we've read about a lot of coaches, um, who have lost their jobs in this off season because they've sort of gone off the rails. Maybe they kicked a, well, I guess Jeremy Kipps still has a job, but um, I think once you get put on administrative leave, it's, it's really only a matter of time, but has sort of gone off the rails. And he said, um, you know, what he observed from Augie after the meet was um, there's no yelling, there's no screaming, but he sat down and, and talked to his team for a good 90 minutes um, after the meet. And so um, at least that little anecdote to me, um, speaks highly of him in the sense that, um, despite a, what has to be an incredibly high pressure, stressful situation, um, he is also engaged with, um, being a human being good, at being a good human being to the people around him, um, at least in, in that instance. All right. Um, we've got some other, uh, things to, uh, hop on to um, the USOPC came with a recommendation um, in regards to the recruiting calendar. Um, there's still plenty of people, myself included, that are violently wringing their hands about um, the shift that's happened in the last couple of years with um, NCA recruiting calendar for swimming um, that basically took the uh, recruiting season for swimming from a very heavily senior year focus to add that whole junior year into it uh, in terms of official visits and um, everything else. Uh, what do you think about this USOP recommendation? And, and in general, Eric, where do you stand on um, what recruiting should like, look like in the sport of swimming? Um, I think it, I don't know. I, I personally like their, their thought on this and in, in reverting back to being a, a more condensed um, senior year. Now I, I know it, it, it is difficult. I recall going through my recruiting process, albeit a little even later um, because the times that I went in March were far different than what I went uh, the previous March by junior year and even that summer leading into those recruiting trips. But in uh, at any event, it just, it seems to me that, that it's hard to get lumped into sports. So they have to have all these rules and they, they want to make it easy. They being the NCAA, just it's easier if they do this and not even consider the population that they're looking at you know, and looking at, um, especially with male development in this sport, it's, it's far cry different than maybe some other sports, you know, obviously. Um, but to me, to just have that extra season for boys takes that pressure off. You're not, uh, for the coaches, it's, it's one less year. You're not, you're not, you're not recruiting your current kids and the junior year and the senior year, you are essentially taking a large piece of your, of that and, and removing it because coaches now at the D1 level do have to recruit their own kids. They do have to make sure that if they want to keep them happy and if they do progress within a season, that they're not having to just now all of a sudden replace them because they're jumping into the portal to, to somewhere else. Now, right. that I, I appreciate that freedom that athletes have to be able to go to a place that maybe they are moving to, but, um, 
I don't know about how some girls may feel just because of development where, you know, if they're getting big offers after their sophomore year and um, sometimes there's a bit more of a plateau or there, you know, there's a little bit more of a security there, but at the same time, they're just verbal commitments. The school can pull it. We don't hear about it, but you know, there's nothing that says that you are, you, you have that money and it's yours. Um, right. But then at the, the, the lastly, I, I look at it as, um, giving families and giving kids a little bit more assurance. And you look at what happened at Auburn and just with somebody who was recruited by the previous regime before Gary, and then that entire staff changed with Gary. Right. And then, so somebody who was recruited by the previous staff was moving into a team and coaches that they didn't sign up for some of those kids that they were on their recruiting trip with graduated. And then on top of that, that tenure didn't last very long at Auburn. So now there's an entire more bigger upheaval. So it's like, right. you imagine that four year window where kids have gone through two complete staffs uh, on a team that's struggling to make it in the top half of the SEC, let alone NCAAs. It's just, yeah. there's, there's, I, the only thing I see that is a, a negative is just that they have to deal with changing it back. Like that's, I can't, I, 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 don't, I don't know enough. I haven't really thought too hard about it but the reality is is like what's what's the negative yeah i mean i so look i said i'm still wringing my hands over this but i will i'm going to take a bit of a different tack i think than i've ever taken on this issue which is to say i think the cat is not getting back in the bag on this one the recruiting calendar has been opened this is the new world um i don't see it changing and so it's sort of on us to make the best of this system. And there are some advantages. Like I, for one, I actually um, have seen that it's pretty nice uh, for uh, juniors to be able to make official visits in the sense that, you know, um, somebody that is um, getting recruited at, at a D1 level trying to cram in five official visits. Now, I wouldn't recommend that you take five official visits, even though you can, but um, in a fall <laughs> is incredibly disruptive. And being able to spread that out a little bit is really yeah. nice. You know, they could do stuff though, of course, to, to uh, address this, you know, like they could move calendars around. Yeah, so say so January you can start, 1. Right, or, or April year. 1, right? Like, yeah. you, you know, make- so Four more so, months. So certainly there's there's reform that could preserve that. But the other thing that I would say is everybody seems to sort of lose their mind in the recruiting process. And I know the natural gravitation is to people committing earlier and earlier. And you feel that if you're not doing that, somehow um, you're missing out. Um, I, I'll say the same thing I say internally to our kids who feel this kind of pressure is just stay focused on um, what it is, like what, what your goals are, what it is you're headed towards. Okay. Um, and there will be opportunities, really good opportunities for you. Right. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I, I, I know that there are places, um, everybody wants to finish their recruiting as fast as possible, but on the other end, nobody, almost nobody does. I don't know if someone's say nobody. Some people yeah. do I, actually. I finished my April of my senior <laughs> year. Like I literally right. had right. two months left of school and I was signing with a school. But I 100% could get behind April 1 start. Like that yeah. would, I think that would appease everybody. Yeah. You know, guys are able to get through their junior year of, of high school swimming minus right. California. But um, right. right. I mean, because I do, I, I hate, I hate like, and I was describing it. Um, to my wife, who's my sounding board for like how, you know, ridiculous things that we have in, in sport. And I go like, yeah, so sort of like for our best athletes, the, um, the developmental calendar has moved to how fast can you be by the spring of your sophomore year, right? And like, she's like, Yo, that sounds awful. I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not ideal, from any any other sense, it 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 it's um it it's it's a terrible system in terms of if you wanted to set up something for optimum development. But um, so I think it's on us um, as coaches to 
you know, see if we can't build some other tracks besides a track that's how fast can you be by the end of um, your sophomore year. We can't do anything about how much pressure is being put on that, but we can certainly um, build out sort of other avenues and um, keep keep people who need a little more time um, on a track to take a little bit more time and, and make the best decision possible. Um, we've got a couple other, uh, I would say, now we're really getting to the top of section. Um, I wanted to, I think in the uh, group chat, I wanted to title this segment, what the heck is going on? <laughs> All right, we've got three topics for what the heck is going on. First, Shane Casas is still in, uh, college station. That's the first one. The second one is what the heck is going on with Shanetta Audison and why is Loretta Race writing articles for Swim Swam uh, based on Google Translate that even make it more confusing what's going on with Shanetta Audison and Lot of Freeze. And then um, finally, how did America leave the world record holder in the hundred back off their world short course championship team? Um, so let's. I want to start with Casas because I know. Um, it's been a while since we talked about Shane and, you know, you always get that little itch behind your ear when we haven't talked about him for a while. So, um, just refresh everybody on the Casas news and then, and then give your analysis. <laughs> All right. Well, if, if you haven't seen the article since yesterday, um, Shane has now, uh, gone back on his decision to move to the University of Texas and so with their pro group uh, in the mean, in the mean, in the short term, you know, and, and he's gone back to AM to work with their pro group now. They have, um, I can't remember, Burl, Barrel, Barrel, yeah, Sorry. something so French, sorry so I her. probably yeah. didn't do it right, but yeah, 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 apologies to her. Um, but you know, she's been there for a while and she's been training great. So, and, and certainly an environment that is conducive to, to pro training. The pool is, the pool is amazing. Um, there's plenty of things that are available to somebody in college stations, have a fun life as a young adult and pro. Um, but now he has come back with the idea of once he signs with an agent, possibly signs with a brand, and is able to find a place to live in Austin, then he will go back out there. So at the meantime, it makes you wonder what happened between trials and the decision to tell his teammates that he was going pro, what, what planning was going on? What was being put in place? Did it, did the, was it the idea that the announcement and that the offers would, the floodgates would open and the offers would come to him? Uh, I don't know. It's just really curious to see what thought was going to happen and versus what has actually happened and announcing pro and it's been crickets. So, yeah, it just, I mean, it just seems like total chaos. What's it was, it was announced that he was leaving and then maybe he was transferring to Texas and then maybe he was going to be a pro at Texas and now he's back at A&M. Um, it just from the outside looking in doesn't look like there's a real well thought out plan. As no, I don't know who was in his, I don't know who was in his ear that said, right. this is what you need to do. When in right. reality, he could have just been like, I'm not going to compete my, this fall, this fall semester. I'm going to yeah. take enough classes to be eligible. Yeah. I'm going to train. I'm going to take a step back and, and make my decision you know, for second semester, because if you're not competing, you're not worried about anything. It's like, you can come back to your boys in January, or you could just transfer into Texas and, yeah. you know, where they might have a spot on that ridiculous roster for you to be able to go to NCAAs, or it gives you time to figure out the whole pro situation yeah. and not just jump into it, but to just have the June that he did and then just haul off and, and make this decision i just I, I worry about who is in his corner being the the person who's telling him what he needs to hear not what he wants to hear yeah and, and, and everybody needs a person in their corner telling them what they need to hear not what they want to hear those right. people who tell you what you want to hear they're just worthless that's how you end up on vh1's behind the music right <laughs> Everybody is that still that is, show. That, is that still a thing? No, it should come back. I'm sure yeah. there's plenty. Yeah, I'm we sure need. there's plenty of ammunition out there. Seriously, but, it's uh, time. Bring but, back 
bring back like, behind the music to streaming. Yeah. We need it maybe, now. Maybe that should be a part of the NIL education system that all these athletes watch VH1 behind the music right. and, and just get some of the best episodes. Yeah. And like, this is what you need to know. Listen, watch the Metallica one where they talk about injecting alcohol directly into their veins to speed up the process. Okay. Um, you know, talk about having a plan uh sometimes you really meticulously plan something out and it just doesn't go the way you think it's going to go and that's the story of what's going on with Shanetta Odison over in Denmark the uh decorated uh Danish athlete retired after the Olympics um I have heard for a long time that she's been working on a book in fact um when I was in Denmark this summer um I heard from multiple sources that um, many people within the Danish Federation were extremely nervous about what was going to be in her book, um, partially because she has uh, blown the whistle on a few, <laughs> a few, I guess, a couple major scandals within Danish swimming, and uh, there was rumblings that there was more um, that she had yet to reveal, and it might be in this book. Um, now, whether that was just sort of like underground marketing hype or whatever, um, but, you know, when you're coming out with a book, one of the things you do is you release some excerpts um, to the public to drum up interest. Oh, I got to really got to read this. There's just some cool stuff in here. Um, and this is an example of one of those gone wrong. I guess maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's not because maybe it is generating a lot of interest in the book. But anyway, um, Shanetta Odison um, revealed in one of these excerpts that she was a party to uh, bullying a lot of freeze. Um, who people, you know, American audiences may remember as the woman who uh, went stroke to stroke, stroke for stroke with Ledecky uh, about eight years ago. They both swam under the world record in the 1500. Um, again, a, a uh, very talented international athlete. Um, and the gist of the story was that, you know, when they were all at the Danish National Training Center together, there were a couple of boys who went to school with Lada. Um, and they would bring things from school and tease her at practice and everybody would sort of pile on. Where things got pretty controversial is um, from all that I've read uh, in Danish media, um, there was sort of no heads up uh, for Lada that this was going to be publicly released. So um, Lada Fries has made a statement. She's pretty upset um, to have this sort of used as a promotional, as promotional material for somebody else's book. She's, she's not too happy to be reading about herself in this way, which I can totally um, understand. And um, probably one of the more controversial parts of it is that Shanetta is a spokesman for an anti-bullying organization within Denmark and admitted sort of that this was um, an ongoing thing and that Eventually, you know, there were some authorities that stepped in and was like, hey, you guys got to cut this out. And by the way, you should apologize. And she didn't apologize at that time. So this is a big mess um, uh, over there. And um, that's sort of my explainer for American audiences, um, you know, so you could get a little bit more context for what's going on um, than maybe Google Translate may give you. Um, Eric, any questions at the end of that uh, treatise? Yeah, I, um, it's a heck of a way to kind of go out. I mean, this scorched earth type of, of path that she's taking with, with the excerpt that, she, excerpt that she puts out, the non-apology that goes along with it in the terribly translated article that we're referencing here. Um, it was probably the most confusing thing that I've, well, I've read in, in a while in terms well, so of she grammar and <laughs> so she apologized, but she apologized, but like, you know, it's kind of one of these weird, like, I'm sorry, cele not sorry. celebrity but... things where it's like, well, why don't you just call the person that you've had a relationship with for 15 years on the phone and just say like, Hey, I'm going to write about this in my book. And I'm, I realized like what I did to you. And I'm really sorry, you know, like, yeah. I, you know, yeah. like instead it's so I, and I, the thing that, and I should have disclosed before I got into that whole explanation it, it'd be uh, beyond a stretch to say that either of these two people are my friends. Um, I've had Shanetta on this podcast um, and the club that I coached when I was in Denmark, we, um, we paid 
uh, Lada to represent us. Um, and so I actually like both of these people. And I, the thing I worry about is, you know, the way it's blowing up at the moment, um, especially domestically, it's sort of like uh, Shanetta bad, Lada good. Um, and I, I actually think, I actually like both of them. Um, I think there's quite a bit more nuance to this. Um, part of it is, um, oh, we've got, we got a surprise guest coming in. He, he heard what we were talking about and he <laughs> decided to join. Um, but, um, hey, Joel, I'm just in the hey. middle of talking about Denmark. So you just buckle up. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I missed it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Shanetta was a type of person who I think was found herself a black sheep in a lot of situations. And some people would argue that she made herself a black sheep in a lot of situations. Um, but, you know, certainly um, she had her fair share of uh, situations where um, I wouldn't say she was bullied by anybody, but um, certainly she had uh, sort of the vipers in the viper pit um, behind her back. And I think that context maybe colors the situation a little bit to where um, she's sort of so used to being on her own um, that, you know, she might have missed sort of a few crucial steps here in this process. Um, and okay, I think that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, finally, and thank goodness Joel is here for this. <laughs> the world record holder in the 100 back short course, an American, will not represent America in the 100 back at the World Short Course Championships. What do you make of that? Joel, I'm gonna go right to you, right off the bench, okay? I, I want I you think, to just shoot the, shoot the J. I think what uh, USA Swimming lacks in, in like notoriety and press, they make up for in bureaucratic structures that, that strangle it to death every single year. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what this is. It's like, you know, if you're gonna be just, you know, again, only relevant once every four years, this is the way to keep on doing it. You know, don't, right. don't, don't try to make anyone into a star. Don't follow NBA. Don't, don't try to like make anyone go, you know what? We could really, these people are there. All these kids are great on Twitter. They're great on social media. Let's maximize it. No, let's just make this like baseball where we'll just like, even worse, we'll make it baseball where it's only again, relevant every four years. It's like, they can make, be a lot more nimble, a lot more open to, to making changes on the fly because it's swimming. You know, why, why not? I, I don't understand it either. Um, but, you know, again, I'm sure some kid got on the team and some coach that actually has some pull is happy now. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things like I would love to see the selection criteria. But on the other hand, do I need to see the selection criteria? Because it's it's an awful selection criteria if somebody can break the world record yeah. within a few months of the meet and then they're not selected. So do it's, I, it's like a lot of third graders sitting around. Well, that, that wouldn't be fair. It's like, you know what? It, it's sport. It's not about fair. It's right. about just putting the best out there, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, and okay. Is it not fair? I don't know. I mean, uh, what meat should people be qualifying for the world short course? It's not a lot of short course meters. It's not like we have yeah. a American short course meters championship where you can, you know, qualify for these things. So what's, what's wrong with the ISL? Like, seems like a perfectly legit short course meet to me to pick from. Um, uh, they, they, they probably didn't figure didn't fill out the right form to have the right official on deck at that moment. That was That's right. The deal. Yeah. That's right. Or maybe they think he broke 15 meters. That would be yes. a real scandal. They go, yes. you know, we looked at the swim and even though the officials there said it was legit we think we think the leading part of the head came up yeah after the yeah. 15 meter <laughs> right um eric Sorry. what do you think <laughs> i mean in in, in in you know listening to listening to brett hawk do everything he can not to curse on his podcast and, and know and with joel talking about it and using that word nimble like it just it's mind-blowing that you can't keep up with what's happening in in swimming we knew isl was going to happen like there was going to be another season we had the draft we had all this stuff going on we had all these athletes that were committing into it so it's not like it came as a surprise but the fact of the matter is it's like you're the national governing body you have the ability 
to make your own rules and to adjust your own rules and to say that it wouldn't be fair because some athletes weren't necessarily ready or going to ISL or whatever it is, is that, yeah. well, big deal. Like you're uh, quite possibly your best short course team showed what they're capable of in March at the NCAA championships. And you could go back and like kind of double check and go on that. And you have your national team director. You have all these coaches who are part of the Olympic staff all these people could come up with a team that could be like, yeah, these, these people need to go. Coleman Stewart needs to be on this team. That t- that time came up, you know, a couple of months ago, whatever, or about what month and a half ago was that, that time was posted. Yeah. But at the yeah. same time, it's like, you're like, Oh, that checks a box. And you know, the invites could just be renegotiated to come out in, in early October or mid October or whatever is give, give the preliminary bouts from the ISL an opportunity. And I'll be damned if they don't hold some people accountable for specific things like training. So, you know, there was happened to be a speedo athlete who happened to be a backstroker that would had a lot of pictures about being on vacation while Coleman Stewart was training hard and going to the ISL. Now, if granted he's, the best backstroker we have in Ryan Murphy and he was at the Olympics and he's great short course, but does he need to go there? Does he need to be there? Like if he's not right. putting in the work right now, you can, you can say too bad. So sad. This is the team that we're going with. If, if, if Shane Casas had made this decision earlier, he could have been in the ISL and he's certainly a short course beast. Like there's, how could we right. not want to send Coleman Stewart and Shane Casas to a short course me when they go. are who they are like yep. why would you not want them in your 100 and 200 back it just you know there's there's a lot to say at the same time i guess you know you're looking at how does um jacob pebbly like he dipped out before trials but right, right now he's our fastest 200 backstroke short course guy he's i think he's the number one seed in the two back for isl so it's like is he not gonna go right right so it's yeah it's yeah well uh i hope we elucidated things for the audiences or just got them fired up um unfortunately i think uh we got to wrap this one uh i have to go to a swim meet um you know for those that are interested the greater philadelphia aquatic club masquerade meet going on this weekend find it on meet mobile see how jersey wahoos are doing okay um Bring one spectator per athlete. We're getting spectators back this year. It's exciting stuff. Um, thank you guys for joining. Joel, thanks for rushing home uh, to give to give uh, a two seconds. There. Yeah, I, awesome. well, I got to hear Eric. Eric say, "I'll be damned and too bad, so sad." So I mean, it, my my yeah. day is made right there. Yeah, 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 right yeah. There. Seriously. Um, all right, talk to you guys. Bye. Three.